Welcome to the Listen Up Podcast, where we explore hearing loss, communication, connections, and health. You know, one of the concepts, and I know you didn't want to get into the ear canal, the ear canal SPO, but uh, the one of the things really or does take into account is because you are testing in that patient's ear, Correct. you're actually accounting for the actual shape and size and width and all of the configurations of that particular person's ear canal for that particular hearing aid with the programming that accounts for that. Would that be absolutely? Fair? And that, that that's the um, that's certainly. If if the manufacturer's fitting algorithm um, that they have in their software, what was perfect was close to perfect, then we'd still be doing probe mic uh, be, to account for the very th- various things you're, you're talking about. We're looking at uh, is there residual ear canal resonance? Right. Um, if you have, which would happen if you have a, a fairly open fitting. Um, if you have a closed fitting. The distance between the end of the ear mold and the tympanic membrane is critical because the SPL that reaches the eardrum, which is called the real ear coupler difference, by the way, um, what happens then is um, the shorter the distance, the greater the SPL is going to be at the eardrum. And and the only way you're going to know that is with your probe mic measures. And this could be a difference of 5 dB or more for somebody who has a small ear canal versus somebody with a large ear canal. So all these little differences start to add up. So for the listeners, the way I kind of understand this, you can correct me, Gus, if I'm wrong. Like the speaker, as what's called in audiology, the receiver, but what we call the speaker in a stereo system, which is where the sound is produced, the distance of that from the microphone, from the eardrum, the closer it is, the more volume or gain you can get for the patient. And so that's the whole point. Like, you know, the algorithms that these companies have are what I say to patients, it's like created for a generic ear canal. It's the sure. generic length, width, height, and circumference. And nobody has that generic ear canal. So, you know, the thing I try to say is, is it's like, you know, that I mean, even somebody who goes to get a suit doesn't actually take it off the rack almost anywhere and start wearing it. I mean, even if you go and get an off the rack suit, you're probably going to get it adjusted. Sure. And so that's the concept is, is everybody needs a little tuck or, or things for certain things, including their hearing. Yeah, well, there's there's a hard, fast rule. And that is if you have the distance, it'll increase it by 60 dB. Uh, and so uh, which is a, a course where in, in uh, infants and toddlers, it's a lot more than just halving the distance. And so you the, the output for an infant or toddler could be 12, 15 dB greater than it would be for an adult with an average size ear. So yeah. uh, we do some extra measurements for those to to account for that. Right. And so ultimately, if I'm explaining, if I'm understanding this correctly, Gus, there's a graph that shows what you need to get to actually 100 percent treat people's hearing loss. That's based on their audiogram. And then you're measuring in the microphone right next to the eardrum what the hearing aid is actually presenting to your your, your ear. And you're trying to see if those two graphs are close because that would imply that the hearing aid is giving you what you need to actually rehabilitate your hearing loss. Correct. And importantly, you need to do that for different input levels uh, because depending on what kind of hearing aid is, um, you could, um, you know, in fact, the manufacturer's algorithms, for example, do a pretty linear fitting because they know people don't like to hear all those soft sounds. So you could have a very good fit for average inputs, but it might be really underfit for soft inputs. And there's actually some data out there that if you're if you're only going to get one right, the one you should get right is for soft inputs, uh, because that's really uh, a bigger life changer to a person uh, is all the soft sounds really changes their socialization. It changes the acoustic scene and it gets them back into the world. You know, we a lot of talk today about lack of socialization and the link to dementia and all that. Uh, g- getting things right for soft sounds are critical. And that's and that's where that's where we have our biggest problem. Yeah. So uh, by example, I think what you're saying is, is like the first thing you want to hear is the sounds of your spouse. <laughs> and those are softer sounds. Unless you have a particularly contentious relationship, they're going to be relatively soft sounds. And those are the things that help you to begin to reconnect with people and conversation. Right. 
people, every patient, average patients typically don't come in, you know, and complain about, well, sometimes they say so-and-so speaks very softly, but you know, uh, um, and, and this might be going out on too far of a limb, but, but, but what the heck, I was writing a paper last year about soft sounds and I, I was, hadn't quite gotten started. I was sitting in my family room, having a cup of coffee. My wife was off at work and you would have said that I was sitting in a quiet room except that before she left, she had started the washing machine. It was winter time, the furnace was on, and we had a humidifier going on an upstairs ledge. All I'm sitting there, what most people would say is a quiet room, but it wasn't quiet, because, and that was my life. Yes. You know, th this, is, this was my life. Well, if I even had about a 30 dB hearing loss, I wouldn't hurt any of those, and I would have been isolated. Yeah, I, and, and I, I, that's, I was, that's the important part. One of my favorite patient interactions on the surgery side is when patient has otosclerosis. And for the audience, that's where one of the earbuds becomes stiff. And when you do the surgery, especially when somebody has it in both ears and they get the first ear done, my favorite conversation is asking them, what are all the things that you heard that you had forgotten to hear before, right? And my favorite one guy just says, Doc, I forgot when I go to the bathroom standing up that there's a noise, right? And you don't even think about that. Yeah. Because, anyway, but I no, like, that is the common yeah, one. I get that. You haven't heard that in a long time, but yeah, yeah. there's noise. And and the older you get, the more important it is to hear that. Yeah, fair enough. But I was just like, well, you know, I mean, and so those are actually the practical things, not that, you know, you can't, you know, go to the bathroom if you don't hear yeah. it, but, you know, they'll say, oh, I was going around my house and I heard a humming and it turned out it was my refrigerator, right? Yep. And so for a lot of us, the absence of the refrigerator is, uh-oh, my radar's on, I have a broken appliance. Sure. But yep. for the hearing impaired, it's neither because they're not hearing it. They don't know they have a broken appliance or not. So it's, oh, the milk's warm. Oh, this has been <laughs> broken for a yeah, day. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, uh, when in my private practice days, I had in a about a 70 font printed out on a sheet of paper that I sent home with all patients because I knew they were going to bring it up. So I wanted to hit, I wanted to hit it head on. And that was the comment. You have to hear what you don't want to hear to know what you don't want to hear, you know, on a, and that's the problem when people first get hearing aids is they hear all these things that they don't really want to hear at that particular time because the brain hasn't gotten used to hearing it. And I don't really even particularly enjoy listening to a washing machine, but, right. but, but I like the fact that I can hear it. I can tell when it stops running and so on. You know? Yeah, no, I agree a hundred percent. And so I, I try to explain to patients, uh, on the surgery side for otosclerosis and other, and when they go to get hearing, it says, oh, look, you know, your brain, you know, it's like going out into the bright light, right? When you go from a dark room and you go out, sure. it's like overwhelming. Unfortunately, your eyes adjust in, you know, several minutes, your brain takes several weeks and that's a whole nother, right? Cause that's yeah. the complaint. I took my hearing aids back. Why'd you take them back? Cause I went to a restaurant and everything was loud. The clanging, I heard the clanging of the dishes more than I heard um, you know, the person went to, I was like, well, yeah. you weren't far enough along, or as you know, consistent wearing is another issue, right? People think yeah. I'll wear my hearing aids when I go out to have lunch with my girlfriends. It's like, well, that's not, that's gonna never going to work. <laughs> no, not. Yeah. You know, the, uh, my favorite was the, and, and, and I apologize to any engineers listener listening, but, but sometimes they can be, uh, difficult patients in the hearing aid business. Uh, and my favorite always was. The, uh, an engineer would go, oh, this is this is a terrible hearing aid. It has background noise. Um, and I, I, I don't want this. It has background noise. I can hear I can hear it. Amplifier noise. Well, I knew what it was. It was simply amplifying the these are people with normal low, lows and going down in the highs. It's amplifying ambient noise. What you and I hear all the time. So I would always say, so, you know, you're an engineer. If we go into the test booth and I close the door. Then it will even be louder, right? Because you'll be able to hear that circuit noise. You know, oh, yeah, yeah. Well, of course, you go in the test booth and close the door and it goes away. Uh, because, because, you know, if you haven't, if yeah, I don't know if you've been in an anechoic chamber, Mark, but, but, but the first time anybody walks into it, the right. comment usually is, wow, this is weird. All right. Cause well, that's real silence. Yeah. And that's the that's but we do the opposite to our patients. And what do they say? Wow, that's weird because yeah. they haven't heard ambient noise for 20 years. Right. No, no I get it 100 percent. And so, you know, and this is, um, again, uh, the, you know, tying it all in when we talked about the, uh, you know, like the, the Mason 
right? Not the bricks, right? Yep. And so, you know, I could try to build a brick wall, plumb straight. It, I just don't have that skill because there are all these inside things that people, that the Mason knows through experience. And that's what you're really getting when you are getting your hearing loss treated and getting well-fitted hearing aids is people not just pushing the buttons, but also being yep. to explain to you, like you said, yep. you know, like, look, it's not the circuit noise and it's going to take your time and you're not going to get there immediately, which, you know, people who have uh, extreme high blood pressure, they don't, they're not given medicines that take them to normotensive right away. Cause the problem is if you do, they faint or pass out because you're sure. taking them there too quickly. And so there are other things in medicine where we can't take people to full treatment right away. And hearing loss is one of those things. Yeah, we actually, uh, Catherine Palmer from the University of Pittsburgh and I uh, developed a scale, uh, Jesus, been 25 years ago now, called the Profile of Aided Loudness. And we, we started by surveying uh, 120 or so normal hearing people, and we had them rate things that you hear in, the every, in everyday life. Just right. every random thing we could think of. There was, um, uh, I can't remember, hundreds of them. And then what we did is we went through and looked what they rated consistently. And we came up with four things that people consistently rated soft, four that they cons consistently rated average, and four that they consistently rated loud. Well, we did a research study after that getting right into this acclimatization that you're talking about is how long does it take people to rate soft sounds soft? Right. Um, at the end of the first month, they were still rating soft sounds as average. That's how they perceived them. So they weren't, so as a general rule, the brain had not fully accommodated right. them. It was still being alerted to these new sounds and uh, judging them as average. It wasn't until two months before it started to come down and and they were they were starting to rank uh, soft sound soft as they were supposed to. Um, and, and so that it gave me a good idea of this doesn't happen overnight. Now, and be, because they participated in the study, supposedly, we don't know, you know, their compliance, but supposedly they were to wear their hearing aids at least six hours a day. And so when did they get to back to normal? I mean, how well, that? they uh, we we stopped the study after let's see about. three months, and at three months their ratings were coming in at like two point three or two point four. That we were either getting twos or threes. It was a seven points rating scale, and uh, now average and loud had always been right from the very beginning. Um, they they responded as normal hearing That's people nice. would. So before they started to hear and rate loudness like normal hearing people rate loudness it took three months yeah and, and that's what i try to explain to people right and then you know that ties into the whole statutory concept of a 30-day trial period and how yeah. that's a different issue it doesn't really make um clinical sense but again that's that's not where we're here to correct today but that whole concept that no wonder people oftentimes try to return by 30 days because they're not even where they need to be. Sure, but, sure. Well, well, of course, on. now, you know, on, on all modern hearing aids, we have data logging. Uh, yeah. And so, you know, you get the patient um, who they, they sort of forget that we have data logging and they tell you the story of how long they've been using the hearing aids. And, and of course, you can hook them up and see how long they've been using the hearing aids. Right. Sometimes not very long. Yeah, which is a shame, right? Because it's like not taking your blood pressure pill. Yeah. Like, you know, you know, ultimately... I always tell people, um, you know, hearing aids in nightstand drawers are not very effective. Correct. Correct. And, and so let's say, you know, somebody gets to the real ear measurement, it's done, and we get within 3 dB, which is awesome. And so now, like, what type of tests can you do to demonstrate measurably that they're doing well? And this was what I was referring to in terms of the hearing and noise. Sure. Yep. Yep. Well, there's... Um... Uh, first of all, I, and let me just say what, um, what what we've been talking about for almost an hour is that at this, if it's a new hearing aid user, uh, the, the comments from the patient, uh, usually I, I, I don't look for delight. Uh, you know, we don't pop a bottle of champagne or anything. Yeah. I usually say, would this be acceptable? Would you be willing to try this for a while? I think it will work. There's 40 years of research that says it will work. So to answer your question more specifically, 
I like to show them, though, that it really does work. And there's there's a there are several hearing and noise tests. And it, it I think it needs to be uh, hearing and a test in noise uh, because you don't want ceiling effects. Um, and uh, the one that's the most popular now, the name is the quick sin. And it's it sentences um, pre-recorded uh, with a background noise, a four talker babble. And the test is presented with the babel changing at six different levels, starting out at a very easy condition and then ending at a very difficult condition at a zero uh, dB signal to noise ratio. In other words, the sentences and, and the, and the um, babble are at the exact same level. And, and even people with normal hearing uh, do not score 100% on that. And again, the test, of course, has been normed, so we know how they would perform. What then I would do is I would sit them down in the test booth. I usually do this bilaterally, unless there's some big asymmetry with the hearing loss. And, and simply the whole goal here is to show hearing aids work and they work in background noise. I would use a relatively soft level, uh, something around 55 dB SPL. Um, so on an audiometer, that would be 40 dB on the audiometer scale. And I would first test them unaided, and then I would test them aided. And um, the results in 90% of the cases, assuming that there's no serious cognitive decline or anything, is it's, it's a world of difference uh, because audibility always wins. You know, I mean, that's audibility is 80% of it. And all the other stuff we do after that is just sort of frosting, you know, all the special features and all that. But audibility is an amazing thing, yeah, uh, which again is why why we need that gain in the high frequencies. Yeah. So when you can detect it, people are happy. I mean, that's yep. and, and to me, it's a nice way. It's a nice way then for them to leave the clinic with a rope. Th that's the one downside of pro Mike. Is, is they don't do anything but just sit there. In fact, you, you tell them, don't, I don't even want you to talk. You got to be quiet when we're doing this. Right. So, you know, it, it's not a it's not a real feel good pass. thing for them, you know. Now, wow. granted, I mean, you, you could I mean, you could take them and walk them down to the waiting room and walk over to the hospital cafeteria. I mean, all of those things have been used uh, since the 1950s. But but I think we could be a bit more scientific than that. I'd like something that I actually uh, this is after I have the hearing aids programmed correctly. So I'm not using this to program the hearing aids. They're already programmed correctly. But I do write down the scores and, and would put it in the patient record. So when they come back and they'd say, uh, wow, something really changed. I'm just not doing the, the way I was before. Uh, now you have a baseline. I mean, I can do my probe mic and I'd say, well, these probe mic measures are exactly the same. It's not the hearing aids. Let's see what happened. I mean, maybe they had a mild stroke. So now you have this baseline that you can go in and, and you can do this measure and see, you know, if they're coming in at about the same place. Yeah, I, I mean, what I, it's funny because it just it resonated with me because there are uh, several times where patients come in and they think their hearing has changed. But what really has changed is they've gone into a different ear listening environment and the some of the weaknesses in the programming of their hearing aid are coming out. And sure. they're, they're having a sudden hearing loss because they're like, oh, I went to such and such function and I couldn't function at all. Right. Yeah. And then the other comment I do get from a lot of patients is, well, you know, it's, it's all great when I'm in the booth. But as soon as I go out to the real world, it doesn't work. And that's what you're trying to get around is to demonstrate to them even in more difficult listening. Environments. Yeah. Yep. Yep. If you and, you know, if, if depending on how fancy you want to get. Um, you, you could have a test set up where you, you present the background noise out of other loudspeakers that are maybe behind the person uh, just to create more a restaurant atmosphere and that. But, but if you want to just keep it simple, uh, it's OK to present the speech and noise out of the same loudspeaker right in front of the person. And it just gives you a nice baseline measure. It's scored then in a signal signal to noise ratio loss meaning how much worse are you than the average person? Unfortunately, it's hard to relate that to a patient because if I say you're five dB worse than the average, that, that doesn't mean much, but it means a lot to me because if I have a patient who their quicks, aided quicksin score is three dB SNR loss compared to somebody who's 12 dB SNR loss, that changes what restaurant they can go to right there. And I tell them that. 
Well, I say they'll be happy. It's, yeah, uh, or they can survive in, or at least have a have a, have a conversation. Well, you can eat in any of them. You just that's can't true. <laughs> you just can't talk <laughs> yeah. in about half of them if it's twelve dB SNR. Yeah. yeah, and perhaps you know, uh, touching on that topic, you know, how well your brain is good at filtering and being. Yeah, yeah, of course, of and course. So, yeah, and the, so I mean, you know, the 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 conclusion is you have to have really or measurement and that's you know what you emailed me when i said well i'd like to talk about the alternatives and your answer was there are no alternatives and i'm in agreement but there are unfortunately alternatives in practice they're just not really the way correct yeah and yeah. by the way just just to add one thing that i can't resist there was a study done a few years ago relative to signal to noise ratio where they compared the manufacturer's first fit to a program fit to the now algorithm the average improvement in background noise uh, across all their subjects across six different hearing aids was um, eight dB, which is and that's it. huge. That's huge. I mean, try listening to something and turn the noise down eight dB. It's it's a different world. Uh, it's a different world, and that's simply programming programming them correctly. Yeah, and you know, I mean, one of the you know, just as kind of as a practical matter. Um, you know, what I, you know, it's even hard for me to get patients, like I'll say, well, what are they doing when they're seeing you? And the answer is always, well, they're hooking me up onto the computer and they're programming it. The problem is, is some people are just going back and the uh, person who the hearing aid care provider is just basically putting in the same program over and over and over again, and they're not getting any better. And patients don't know how to discern if that is or isn't happening. And so I now describe to them really a measurement of sure. what happens to see. Well, you know, and, and just for your viewers, uh, that we do it. There is a standard. Uh, it's the Audiology Practice Standard Organization, APSO. The standard is not a secret. Uh, any consumer can Google that site, print out the standard. There's 15 steps um, that one takes to follow to follow the standard. You know, I'm I'm thinking if electricians have standard um your 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 carpenter has a standard uh we you know it, it's probably okay for audiologists to have standards too i think yeah well i mean just as an aside uh, uh the the most recent episode i recorded before you was somebody from that organization oh okay well you're well aware of it yeah no, no i mean because somebody had mentioned it to me and i was like you know that's the whole point right like how do we get our patients aware and how do we empower them? And that's that was actually the conversation I was saying to you. I don't think you can change licensure. I think that you need to uh, empower consumers to know what they are and aren't Correct. getting. Yeah. That's ultimately going to be the answer, right? Because you know it's hard to you can't force people to have quality. If that makes sense. Well, it would be very difficult, and no organization is going to want to do it. Yeah, um, the, the, the people who aren't doing it aren't going to start are going to stop paying dues. That's for sure. Correct, <laughs> They're yeah. not going to like it. And and so you know, one of the the unfortunate things is is, and you can correct me what the statistics are. I know that there are more real ear measurement machines out there than people actually using them. So unfortunately, there are some idle machines. What are the percentage? Do you, do you know the statistic? Um, that? I can tell you from ten years ago, and I don't know if there's been a very systematic study done. Um, I, I did one 10 years ago when I worked for the Hearing Journal. Um, and, and people exaggerate on these things. So you have to, but, but I'm going to answer the question that you asked. asked. Um, but, but the overall levels are higher than what they really are. Roughly, uh, we asked what percent of people do um, probe mic at least 50% of the time. Okay. And, and you know that th th this is higher than it really is, but, but, but it came out to 40%. OK, so this was a survey monkey thing. So we could have people jump around to various questions. So then what we took was we took all the people who said they owned or had access to pro mic equipment and we asked them what percent they did it. And it went up to 52 percent. So it only increased by 12 percent for the people who had the system, which meant 48 percent of the people who have it. Uh, the dust cover sits on it uh, uh, most or nearly all the time. Yeah, no, and that's unfortunate, right? Because they yeah. have the tool there. And so this actually brought up a question. So how often, you know, I mean, uh, you know, so uh, my 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 concept is that, you know, uh, hearing loss is a health problem and it should be monitored so that you should get a evaluation on a yearly basis. So, uh, but probe, Mike, I assume you would, would you agree needs to be, um, 
done if people have a change in their audiogram or some other change. But other than that, you don't need to do it again. Or what do you think? Um, well, let's start with the assumption that you fit them to correctly to begin with. Correct. Uh, and you don't need to bump them up. Um, then I, I would go exactly what you're saying. Uh, you know, it would be two things. Uh, if the patient says things aren't looking just right, um, or if the pay, or if there's a change in hearing, um, otherwise, if somebody just came in for an um, annual eval, um, everything's working fine. Uh, the hearing loss looks okay. I don't think I personally would repeat probe mic again. I, I wouldn't really have, you know, a reason to do that. Um, there could be a receiver that was plugged and the patient didn't know it, but Usually they're pretty good at, uh, you know, you, you know, as well as I, it depends on how many people are in the waiting room and how well you like the patient. And and if I didn't have, you know, if I, I had a spare 15, 20 minutes, uh, I might do it just to for my own curiosity and just to ensure. But, I you know, if somebody said they didn't do that, I I, I would say, yeah, that's probably OK. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, and so that, you know, and, and what I would say to the audience is, is you got to get there with the probe mic. And then if somebody sees your follow up, there could, there are other tests they could do, like the hearing and noise to see how you're performing sure. like that, um, you know, to see how your overall function is. And so it, it's just kind of interesting thinking about like from a practice standards, how often it should be done yeah. and things like that. And, you know, of course, if, if you had a, um, if you had a larger clinic, um, which, which I did during my 20 years in the military, I had uh, eight technicians working in the audiology department. You also can run the hearing aids on a 2cc coupler. So if, if you knew what, what the programming was to begin with, you could, you could have a tech while, while you're back seeing a different patient, the tech could be running their hearing aids on a coupler on a box to, to see, you know, if the hearing aids have changed or not since they left. Uh, right. There aren't too many centers that do that just because of lack of personnel. So it's a it's a dummy ear canal. It's a coupler. It, no, it's an actual coupler. Uh, but but see, you, you could there's standard corrections. So uh -huh. if you could see what the hearing aid was programmed to and you could see if it was pro, it, it was the same as what it had been in the probe mic measures or uh -huh. at least so relatively it's close. Extrapolate out the real ear measure. Correct. Correct. Put it yeah. onto this device. Yeah, we have correction factors from the difference between the ear to the coupler. Right. And so can you program another uh, hearing aid off of the coupler without doing the real air measurement for that? Patient? Yeah, well, that's done. That's done very commonly with with uh, infants and toddlers. Uh, the key measurement that you need, which we touched on a while ago, is what's called the real ear to coupler difference. And that is at, which you can measure very quickly simply with a foam earplug. So if you know how that ear canal is different than a coupler, then you can fit the hearing aid in the coupler by entering in the correction factors for that child's ear. And when you then put the hearing aid on that child's ear, Assuming that the depth of the ear mold is about the same as the depth of the foam plug that you had in the ear, you will have a fitting that's within 2 dB if you'd actually done real ear measurements on that infant. That's amazing. It yeah. is. And it's, a, it's, a, it's an art. And it's, uh, uh, I admire the people who are dedicated to pediatric hearing aid fittings because it's, it's so critical. You know, we're talking about audibility for adults, but for children, you know, audibility is, is everything. They, they need to develop speech and language. And, and their feedback is different, obviously. Sure. Yep. So, yep. so, you know, um, uh, for the audience, this is uh, Dr. Gustav Mueller. Uh, he's uh, obviously been an incredible teacher today for us. Uh, Dr. Mueller, I always like to ask people, you know, what's your favorite sound? I mean, like, you know, we're in the sound business or field. What's your favorite sound? Um. Well, to keep it PG-13, <laughs> I would say the I would say the pop of a wine cork. Um, that's a good one. That's a good one. And, and uh, you know, if people wanted to get a hold of you, how would they get a hold of you? Um, you know, I, I, uh, I'm, um, I'm work about twelve days a month, and on the other days, I, I don't have any hobbies. So I'm, I'm very happy to. If somebody had a question for me, I, I'd be very happy to do my best. I'm not directly fitting hearing aids, so I may have to send it to somebody else. But, uh, but I'm, I'm easy to find. Uh, Gus at gusmuller.net. Yeah, no, I, I think, you know, this has been amazing education for me, and I really um, appreciate you uh, 
sharing. And, and uh, I'll be honest, I got to go back and look at some of your other work. There might be some other things I'd love to talk to you about. <laughs> sure. Sometime in the future. This, is, this has been amazing. Again, uh, for the listeners, this is Dr. Uh, Gus Mueller. He's, uh, I, I mean, kind of, you know, one of the things was I said to somebody, I said, uh, who should I talk to about real or measure? And it wasn't even out of my mouth. He said, <laughs> Gus Mueller. And so that was uh, the reference. And so uh, appropriately so. And I, well, we, uh, j- j- sorry to interrupt, but just to make a, a point here for our listeners, uh, we wrote the first book on it uh, in 1991. So if, if anybody tells you it's something new, uh, <laughs> try driving a 1991 car and see how new you think it is. Well, new to them, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Not, not new to the field. Yeah. And yeah. So, you know, I mean, uh, having kind of tried to figure this field out for myself, because I mean, my, my origin's been trying to understand why so many patients come to me and are dissatisfied with their hearing aids. And I'm kind of working my way backwards to all of sure. this. Um, you know, it, it's an amazing thing and, and certainly highly important and frankly, differentiating, right? So you yep. mentioned that it's differentiating for your wife that people figure out that she does something that everybody else doesn't where you are. And exactly. So, um, this has been uh, a wonderful uh, time. I really appreciate you uh, sharing your awesome knowledge. I've learned a ton today and uh, thanks for coming on. I'm sure. You bet. Good times. Thank you. Thanks. So Thanks for tuning in to the Listen Up podcast. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get updates on future episodes.